Okay, um, I want to begin by welcoming you all to this webinar celebrating Rights of Nature, the spring 2024 issue of Orion Magazine. I'm so glad to see so many people here. Uh, my, my name is Ryan Dar. I'm a fellow at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. The Institute of Sacred Music, for those who don't know, is a multidisciplinary institute at Yale dedicated to the study and practice of music, ritual, and the sacred arts. We're hosting this webinar as part of an initiative, initiative called the Religion, Ecology, and Expressive Culture Initiative. This initiative was launched just last year, and it seeks to foster and disseminate the work of scholars, artists, religious leaders, and activists uh, from all disciplines, all religious traditions, uh, working at the intersection of religion, ecology, and the arts. So uh, we're thrilled uh, um, to be hosting this event with Orion. The connections that the rights of nature issue draws between ritual and ecological issues are exactly the kinds of connections that our initiative is excited to support. So hosting this event with Orion is an exciting partnership for us. Uh, before I hand it over to Amy, I'm going to just put two links in the chat. Uh, the first is for our initiative. If you follow this link, you can explore upcoming events and our call for proposals. You can also sign up for our mailing list in um, under Contact Us. And I'm also putting a second link in the chat, uh, which is the event page for an upcoming webinar that um, ex will explore themes of religion, art, and climate that might be of interest to some of you. OK, so uh, I'm going to stop talking now and hand it over to Amy Brady, the executive director and publisher of Orion Magazine. Thanks so much, Ryan. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as Ryan said, I'm Amy Brady. I'm Orion's executive director and publisher. And my Orion colleagues and I could not be more thrilled to be collaborating with the Yale Institute of Sacred Music to present today's conversation between Mary Evelyn Tucker and Sumana Roy. This event is in celebration of Orion's spring issue, which was guest edited by Mary Evelyn. The issue celebrates and explores how spiritual rituals are practiced across traditions, regions, and time to learn how the divine repeatedly centers on elements from our environments and why. If you love today's conversation, then you will love Orion, a magazine that has for more than 40 years published essays, poems, and art about the mysterious ways in which humans connect with their environments, the more than human world, and each other. So starting with our spring 2024 issue, the magazine is also now printed on 100% recycled paper made from post-consumer waste. To celebrate this landmark in our publishing history, our new spring issue, and as a thank you for all of you to, for being here today, I'd like to offer you a 20% off discount on a one-year subscription to Orion, which will begin with the spring issue. And you can get that discount by clicking on the link in the chat. Uh, that discount is good through this Sunday, so please use it soon. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our speakers, but first, just a couple of things. Uh, they want to hear from you today. So if you have any questions as uh, Mary Evelyn and Sumana are chatting, please drop your questions in the Q&A icon that is at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop or um, is uh, should also be appearing on mobile devices. And we will get to as many of the questions today as we can. The other thing to say is that today's event is also being recorded. So if you uh, are afraid of missing anything or if you've missed a name or there's something that you wanna review in this conversation, you will have the chance to do so when the recording is sent to everyone who registered uh, probably sometime in the next couple of days. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest this afternoon. Please welcome Sumana Roy who contributed to our spring issue. Simone, uh, Simana is also the author of several works of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. They include How I Became a Tree, a novel called Missing, and a book of poems entitled Out of Syllabus. Her latest book, which came out just last month on Yale University Press, is entitled Provincials, Postcards from the Peripheries. 
And you can purchase Sumana's latest book from Yale Books at the link here in the chat. Sumana also teaches at Ashoka University in Haryana, India. She was a Carson Fellow at the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society in 2018. And that same year, she was a visiting fellow at the South Asia Program at Cornell University and a fellow at the Plant Humanities Lab at Harvard. Sumana will be in conversation today with O'Brien's dear friend, uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker, who also guest edited our spring issue. Mary Evelyn is a co-director of the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology with John Grimm at the Yale Center for Environmental Justice. And together, Mary Evelyn and John have written Ecology and Religion and created six online classes entitled Religions and Ecology, Restoring the Earth Community. They are also executive producers of the Emmy award-winning film Journey of the Universe and creators of three courses on the film, the book, and Thomas Berry. Mary Evelyn wrote the film and book with cosmologist Brian Swimmy. So thank you both for joining us. And Mary Evelyn, I'll pass things over to you. Thank you so much, Amy. And what a pleasure to be with all of you at the Institute for Sacred Music. We thank Martin Jean, the director. We thank Evan Graves and Ryan Darr, our wonderful colleagues in this webinar. Uh, and we thank all those working <clears throat> at Orion, especially the editor, Sumanth, um, for this beautiful issue. And before we begin our conversation, I just wanted to give a context uh, for what we'll be talking about today with Sumana, because this beautiful issue on recycled paper for the first time for Orion um, is a bouquet, if you will, a flowering uh, plant of various articles that bring together the seasonal rights of nature, the rites of passage, and a whole other range of rituals. And this is R-I-T-E-S, as you know, uh, which is a complement to rites of nature that's growing around the world. But the point here I wanted to just emphasize is these seasonal rituals that we all participate in here in the Northern Hemisphere or spring. And I wanted to mention one of Ellen Bernstein's that celebrates spring, the Song of Songs from the Bible. And Ellen was a great leader in Judaism and ecology and all this work in religion and ecology. And she just passed away a month ago. So I wanted to honor her, say this is one of her last essays uh, published. And uh, I hope you'll have a chance to read that. There's also one for the summer um, rites of passage. And that's an incredible festival in Japan uh, called Gion, um, which is almost a thousand year old festival. And it was to deal with the plagues in the summer. I saw that festival 50 years ago when I first went to Japan uh, to study and teach. It's an amazing one. And then there's a, a short article on winter by Tom Barron, which talks about his mother saying, even under the snow, there were flowers. So there's seasonal rituals and then there's rites of passage. There's rituals here on birth, a beautiful one um, about a Hopi child. And the title is First Touch of Sun, The Grounding of a Hopi Infant by Valerie Nuyatiet Etsuba. Sorry about the pronunciation. Um, and there's another one about green burials uh, that's very, very interesting by Martha Park. And Emily Robito has done an amazing one about her father's death uh, called Gut Bucket. So with that sense of rituals that help us manage life, help us manage the seasons and so on. We're coming to explore with Sumana her magnificent essay on marriage rituals in India. Um, the title of that is Guests of Honor, Reading the Language of Roots and Blossoms in Wedding Rituals. So we're going to begin by inviting Sumana to describe her title and uh, give us a sense of what she had in mind with that beautiful title, Guests of Honor. Thank you, Sumana. Uh, thank you, Amy, Ryan, Mary Evelyn, and the entire team of Orion uh, for having me here. Uh, about the title, I, <laughs> I'll have to confess that I cannot take credit for this, for neither the title nor the subtitle came from me. They must owe to you, Mary Evelyn, as guest editor or to Sumanth and the Orion team. 
Uh, I remember uh, Suman Prabhakar, the editor, asked me to write about rituals associated with Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist weddings. And I said, yes, just because I felt I didn't know enough. And that for me, uh, as I've told you before, is always the impetus that writing something will lead to a process of discovery rather than a record of what I think I already know. Um, so I turned to the limited archive of my own experience and it suddenly struck me uh, that the effort to involve and invite the plant world for a wedding, for a Hindu wedding, such as the one, uh, the kind of wedding I had, was much more, the effort that went into it uh, to invite the plant world was much more than the invitations that were being made to my relatives and acquaintances, both of whom were human. So one's relationship with rituals, with rites, uh, R-I-T-E-S, is always and perhaps inevitably a bit teenagerish, as in one can't really take them seriously. And I was no exception. I hadn't paid any great attention to them two decades ago when I was getting married. I decided to write about these guests who lay um, outside the code of invitation cards of literacy, those who could not be invited by uh, invitation cards. And I began to notice from my recollections of weddings, both mine and those that I have attended, that the fun and delight is always given, or uh, sorry, the fun and delight is always created by these presences of the plant world, of the elements, and not necessarily of human wedding guests alone. So when the essay came back to me from Sumanth uh, after the edits with a title, I just felt so grateful that yes, indeed, they were the real guests of honor. All the plants, the agricultural produce, water from the river and the neighboring wells, wells uh, the fire and air and so on. About the subtitle, um, Again, Mary Evelyn, I can't take any credit for it, believe me. It's the editorial team at Orion who have always made my uh, writing better. Um, as you said, the subtitle of my essay is Reading the Language of Roots and Blossoms in Wedding Rituals. That's the subtitle. So while writing the essay, it, um, it struck me that it wasn't only the living forms who lived above the ground like people like you and me, all of us here on Zoom today, who were being invited. Uh, the underground and its colored living forms, turmeric, for instance, was very important to these rituals. Uh, you know, today, in an environment like the kind we find ourselves in at this moment, we like to speak about inclusivity in academia with a lot of, uh, you know, a feeling of exaggerated academic nobility. But what, but what and um, who we include is still about control, is about gatekeeping. And I liked, while thinking about these rituals and these rites, I liked how the invisible, those of the air and those living underground, how they were giving such affectionate prominence in these wedding rituals. You know, flowers, for instance, are glamorous. They will always get seating in the front row, but not roots necessarily. And I noticed that. And so, you know, with the invitation to the river, to water, to fire, to things that burn and enter us through our nostrils, um, I'm thinking smoke and incense and camphor and coconut coir and ghee and mustard oil. So this creation of a um, heightened sensory experience, oh, I realized that it was this that gave the occasion memorability. Uh, that made it eventful. This purposeful remembrance of, you know, biological ancestors in the evolutionary ladder, this invitation to multiple species. For me, the rituals, um, I think, became about that. I love it. And the beauty of this is all of these webinars with Orion have been helping us to have a sense of multiple ways of seeing, of knowing. And your article, as you've just said, brings in all the senses through the elements and uh, the beauty that surrounds us. But I love 
I'm actually um, delighted in some ways that you weren't fully conscious when you were a bride and being married just because there's so much excitement going on. But what I think <laughs> you're bringing into the reflection is that these rituals ground the person going through them, even if they're not conscious, as your yes. article brings into full consciousness, right? So yes, unconscious becoming conscious, the invisible in the world around us becoming conscious. So mm -hmm. that beauty is astonishing for all of us to see through this article and that sense of being wrapped in the world of nature, woven into it through this ritual. So I wonder if you'd like to um, open up a passage from the article that we can hear the language because the language is so important and then we'll discuss that a little bit more, but it gives us a feel of this poetic language that you uh, draw forth almost effortlessly, even though we know it takes a lot of effort. <laughs> thank you. Thank you always for the kind things you say. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to read a passage from towards the beginning of the essay where uh, my, my aunts and my, uh, my female relatives went uh, to invite the elements as is common in a in the kind of Bengali Hindu wedding that I had. So I'll just read a, a paragraph. Yes, please. The rituals are not just an invitation to the elements. They are invocations of the five senses, their allies, where their presence is urgently and immediately registered. These occasions, worship and weddings, have a fragrance that marks their difference from other days on the emotional calendar. Not of flowers alone, whose intensity is the most subtle among the mix, but also various things being burned, camphor, coconut coir, mustard oil, or cotton wicks burning to give light, incense sticks and dhuno, a kind of res resin, fragrant rice being washed and cooked, the dominating and affectionate aroma of ghee, melting, burning, solidifying. It is not just the visible that is invited. The wedding would be incomplete without those who live underground, away from the eye, and so haldi, turmeric. I think of the Latin from which its name is derived, terra merita. Occasionally, when I put it in almost everything I cook, and also of its rituals of beautification, without which, Weddings and other auspicious occasions seem incomplete. Like Tulsi, the holy basil, and honey, turmeric's antiseptic qualities are heightened in folk wisdom. Whether at a wedding or on the morning of Saraswati Puja, the day that inaugurates spring in our hemisphere, all I remember is a cosmology of arms, or is a cosmology of human arms rubbing and grinding, digging and dyeing oneself with turmeric. Its peculiar smell of the goodness of earth condensed into a lump, a clod, a rhizome, is subtle, but almost as stubborn as its stain. In all these names, in all the names that, is ha that it has, for instance, in the Indian subcontinent, in an awareness of its ritualistic use on various occasions, gauri, which means to make fair, Bahula, plenty, Bhadra, auspicious, Haridra, which means dear to Hari, to Krishna, Yamini and Nishakya Ratrimanika, the damp grace of darkness rests in them. The memory of soil, its older life, also Kaveri and Vairagi, one prostitute and one free of desire, antonyms in one being, Turmeric, like other root vegetables, has color, but rejects gloss. Orange, yellow, white, pink, competitive with those above the earth, it, overcomp it overcompensates like those from a culture of deprivation. Uh, I think I'll stop here for want of time. Thank you so much, though. It gives the oral quality of this language and, of course, the mingling of all of the 
uh, spices <laughs> along with the flowers and so on. And it's like a litany, isn't it? You're lifting up something that feels like a litany, a ritual, a blessing, and drawing in the blessing of of the land of the living things, that this is a living earth community all around you. And that's what rituals do in their best form. And I have another a passage, just a short passage I'd like to draw you out on, because we can understand these ideas about plants and flowers and spices and so on. We can see them scientifically, we can study them in terms of agriculture and so on but we can also see them symbolically, right? And through a language that gives us a symbolic consciousness. That's what we're trying to redevelop, aren't we? A symbolic consciousness about the world around us. And you say this beautifully because you say the sensual part of these rituals is overwhelming for those not inside the tradition. Hinduism, as you say later, Jainism and Buddhism are incorporated. Mm -hmm. but being embedded in such rituals give, gives life to the whole community. And you make the point that these rituals are, and the invocation of plant life in particular, are like poems whose interpretation must be left open. Everything is symbiotic, symbolic. Everything is more than what is being done because of the power of the invisible. So there's a symbiosis here and there's symbolism going on, right? Would mm -hmm. you like to comment on that? Yeah, so uh, as you might remember, I say that everything is symbolic because we don't really know what they represent. And particularly now where we are choked by a culture of representation, where everything is supposed to stand for something or the other. These rites, these rituals uh, are a reminder that everything cannot be experienced just through representation. Uh, you know, so these are synecdoches, except that we don't know what the whole in the part for the whole is. And I think this is what makes it so interesting and delightful and moves it in this inter to that in to this interstitial space between life and art, making it a living art where we, where the human and the human world, um, fluid as it is, become a kind of a space, a canvas for living art as it were. Um, I also think of thinking of my own experience of these weddings and you know they are like they're like a preface. They are supposed to inaugurate something. But at that moment when one ritual follows the other, um, some plant brought in some the sequence of flowers and leaves and grains and um, herbs, Everything feels like a preface, including the wedding and the marriage. So this prefatory character oh, that, that, and the hopefulness that comes with this prefatory character, I think uh, gives it that kind of delightful energy. And we experience no matter who we are in terms of our socioeconomic class background, we are able to experience the delight of this, these rites and rituals because we come into contact with nature in the most wholesome way. We recognize that while the human social world might be miserly, there is nothing miserly about uh, nature that it that it gives in such abundance. I also think um, of a kind of a presence of, you know, one subconsciously feels connected to an ancestral energy. And I mean, not human ancestors alone. You know, at this moment, one has the feeling that we've been allowed to become our ancestors at these moments of chosen communion, not by becoming the humans that they that our human ancestors might have been, 
but by reestablishing our relationship with the plant and natural and elemental world that we imagine was theirs of our human ancestors. And these rituals have stayed alive, Mary Evelyn, I think, not for dogmatic reasons, but for their inherent playfulness. So that the addition of a new ritual is like a new game or the next level of a video game, as it were, uh, that has been added. So it is meant to bring joy and humor and laughter to what is basically a serious occasion, such as a wedding. And I, I, I think what I like about the character of these rituals is that there is no final draft, that it is constantly being edited. Um, let me think of an example. Um, say, let, say Shitala Puja, for instance, a folk Hindu goddess invented in possibly uh, the 19th century, in, in possibly 19th century, century Bengal to help a people fight pox. I think climate change, what we're experiencing now, will perhaps force new additions to these rituals. Um, I'll give you an example, Bhai Pota, where the sister puts a mark on the brother's forehead a few days after Kali Puja or Diwali needs dew drops. And I would collect these dew drops from grass and other leaves in the morning in our garden. But now because of climate change, because of changing seasonal patterns, usually in late October or November when we have Bhai Pota, uh, there, are, there is no dew drop to be had. So I'm sure some edit will happen and the ritual will change to accommodate something. Um, yeah, I don't know whether that answers your question. I think that's fantastic because so many people are saying, how can we do rituals of mourning in a time of death and rebirth all around us? So I think that's exceedingly important. And uh, because rituals give catharsis. I love your sense of play. One of the articles is called Sacred Play here. Um, and John, my husband, has a deep sense that religions originated with play, with delight. Yes. And hopefully it's, yes. it's effervescence, right? It's something sort of bubbling up from the, the livingness of things into us that gets us excited. I can feel the energy in what you do. It's marvelous. really marvelous. And, you know, maybe that's a transition to, um, and, and it's a reminder of why we need rituals. They're not fossilized, right? And I try and say this yes. in my preface. But what I'd love to have you talk about is, um, and we're going kind of to How I Became a Tree, your marvelous book from Yale. So what is it that impacts you in terms of plants, of trees, the love that you have for them is astonishing, you know, the knowledge, but it's a knowledge that's not just scientific and botanical, it's embedded in an incredible consciousness that's something we're all trying to bring back, recover. So I'd love to hear something about your love of plants and trees. Um, uh, how do I say this without, uh, you know, maybe, um, I hope I don't sound narcissistic, but narcissus is also the name of a flower, lest we forget. Uh, see, my name is Shumana. In the linguistic cultures I come from, a name is often seen to be related to the person one becomes. Again, a sort of play, a kind of play that, uh, you know, we are discussing, you were just mentioning a little while ago. So it's a bit fatalistic in a funny, in a humorous way, that one's name can be instructive in this metaphorical or symbolic way. So Shumana is Shu, meaning good, and Mana is mind. So Shumana is a good mind. I'm very grateful to my parents for giving me this name, but I must also share with you a common mispronunciation of my name. So people from Northern and Western India, for instance, I'm in Northern India, I'm in Haryana at this moment, they often call me Suman, dropping the vowel at the end. Suman is flower. So I'm grateful for both these names, the, also the mispronunciation, and what living in the magnetic fields of both Shumana, which means a good mind, and Suman, which means flower, have allowed me to do um, 
or the life they have compelled me to live. All of this is to say that just as I live with my name and the unexpected directions it takes me to, so with my relationship with plant life. They are a part of my life uh, without my awareness or volition. You know, I, I have a broken upper arm. So just as I only became aware of my left arm, only after it broke, and just as we become aware of the heart, only after heartbreak, so with my relation with plants, I became or I become aware of their absence when they are not there. I feel an unease or to tweak Wordsworth, they disturb me with their absence as they do now, for instance, when I go from the airport to my home in Shiliguri, the small sub Himalayan town uh, where I live where the oldest trees of the region have been killed to make roads and highways over the last one year. Uh, you asked me to uh, speak about how I became a tree and what made me want to write it. It wasn't, as you um, guessed absolutely correctly, it wasn't a botanical uh, urge. You know, I was going through a very difficult time in my emotional life and I, and I wanted to live a life outside the human social at that moment, I groped for, you know, metaphorically for forms of life that would be able to hold what I sought from life at that moment. So at one point of time, I thought, uh, I want to live like a dog. And anyone who has, I've said this multiple times before, anyone who's lived with a dog knows that it is not outside the emotion economy that I was seeking. Similarly with, I remember um, thinking, do I want to live like the ceiling fan that is moving above my head at this moment? And again, I thought it has no agency. And I remember being very, very unwell. This was about eight to 10 years ago, perhaps even before that. Very unwell, I had jaundice. I was lying down, it was afternoon. And suddenly um, the papaya leaves the leaves of the papaya tree outside my bedroom window, the shadows, the, after, of the afternoon shadows, I saw them on the white ceiling of my bedroom where I was lying, um, you know, trying to get better. And something moved in me, something changed in me. Uh, and I thought, I haven't done anything to plant these, uh, this papaya plant. Someone else has pollinated it, possibly a bird or animal. And yet it has given me something. Uh, so, you know, in that moment of epiphany, I thought, I want to live like a tree. And it is such a silly desire that it is impossible to share this with anyone. And I nursed this desire in me for months, possibly years, feeling, quote unquote, abnormal all the time. And then a few years passed and I thought to myself, surely I couldn't be the only abnormal person who's wanted to live like a tree. And then began the quest for finding people like myself, not as ordinary and unremarkable as I am, but you know, filmmakers, spiritual thinkers, scientists, um, writers, who had wanted to live like a tree. That is how I discovered, for instance, um, Tagore. I had, of course, read being Bengali, I had had to read and meet and encounter Tagore right from the time I was uh, very little. But it occurred to me, why did Siddhartha need to walk for so many miles and then sit under the tree to become the Buddha? And almost by coincidence, I discovered that Jagadish Chandra Bose, the scientist who proved to the world a little more than 100 years ago that plants were living and possibly sentient beings, that he too, or that I too, like him and his wife, did not have biological human children of my own, and that he did not have biological children of his own. And as I began to read through his research papers, I noticed how he was constantly referring to plant life as infants or as children, and so on. So I discovered this community, and what would become how I became a tree did not really set out to begin life as a book, it was meant to be something that I was 
putting together to save myself. I did not have a laptop of my own at that time. And only when I could afford to buy one, did I start putting these notes that I had made you know, scribbled on my way to work, sometimes sitting on the pot at night as my husband slept and putting, feeding them to my computer and then discovering that all these notes had the shape of a quest, which was to find out this community of people who had wanted to live like a tree. That is how, how I became a tree happened. I love it. <laughs> it's so beautiful. And <clears throat> this book, of course, is absolutely marvelous. The whimsical brilliance of it just shines forth. You will love it, each chapter being uh, a delightful play. <laughs> um, so there's some questions in the, the Q&A, but I also wanted just to give you a moment before we go to Q&A to uh, say something about your new book uh, and Provincials that's coming out from Yale right now, but also to note that we hope, we trust, you'll be here at Yale in the fall, in the second week of September. And we want to celebrate your books in the plural and uh, listen to what you have to say and um, enjoy some good food, Indian or otherwise, together. <laughs> you tell us a little bit about your new book, Provincials, from Yale. Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking me about it. Provincials actually came out in the U.S. last week, as uh, Emmy said, on the 26th of March, to be precise. Um, I shared this with you when we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, Mary Evelyn, that someone called me a provincial about two decades ago. And I remember rushing home after the night train journey from that city to my home in the small town in sub Himalayan Bengal to check whether the word uh, provincial that this person had used for me was really the pejorative I thought it was. You know, it occurred to me that the place where we are born and where we are raised, that it could be used to characterize us unfavorably was a surprise. And I'll admit even now, it feels like a shock. What was it that made me a provincial? And, you know, and just a little while ago, when you asked me about how I became a tree, uh, I, I told you that because my impulse is always in looking for a community across space and time, like I had felt the urge to do in what would become how I became a tree, I asked myself the same question. Who are the other provincials? What makes them provincials? This was two decades ago. And it has taken me so many decades of my life to understand that my first unconscious understanding of the province and the provincial and provinciality was its distance from light. Um, at that time, when I was very young, I was still uneducated in the politics of light, that even if it traveled in straight lines, its pathways were not straight, that it bended like these do uh, when in the presence of power the words and their reservoirs would come later. For instance, enlightenment and in the dark, uh, spotlight and in the wings. And I would, from my own history, gradually come to recognize what a life in the penumbra meant and that there were many more of us there than those in the limelight. And as you often reminded me, um, and I'm grateful to you for that, that my, because my understanding of life since my understanding of uh, life has come to me from the natural world, and it's not uncommon as I've come to see for those of us who because of the lack of books and allied institutions of scholasticism uh, came to be educated by their immediate surroundings, um, by the plant and elemental world, for instance, that Sanskriti, meaning culture, came from the word Sanskrit, the language, the habitat of the city, and Prakriti, meaning nature, with its etymological connection with Prakrit, the more colloquial language, the habitat of the provinces, the town, and the village. I have also turned to plants from time to time, since, as you've guessed, my ethics have been formed by plant life. What are the provinces in the body of a tree? Is it its roots? Is it the far ends of branches or flowers that fall off? And I think of grass, and I think, no, grass has no provinces. 
that it's possible that there is equal distribution of attention or its opposite neglect in its form. Imagining an ideal world as rhizomatic is to do away with the imbalances of power, of light, of the capital of attention. And to imagine, therefore, will there be provinces in this imagined equitable world? All of these, have, uh, all of these um, thoughts have come very late to me, uh, very late in my life, after experience, of course. Um, so see, uh, for instance, I was born with a congenital cataract in my right eye. And that knowledge, of course, it's only a piece of information, doesn't annotate my vision. The way I would have been able to see the world, not like the six by six, those with perfect vision have been able to, I suppose. Uh, but I've never felt like a victim, never felt deprived of seeing less than others. And so with being a provincial, you know, I took this experience of belatedness, uh, of waiting, of the reading and artistic habits of those like me to be common and I'll confess even universal. Um, like we are able to see the contours of our family only after we've come out of the house or from the retreat of our bathroom. I could see this only after I'd been able to see the shape of my shadow. So I began to see my relatives, those scattered all across the world, not related to me by blood, some dead but also alive in books and letters and films and songs and art. For instance, uh, you'll remember I was telling you the upstart crow in borrowed feathers who had moved from Stratford upon Avon to London. Rabindranath Tagore moving from the city to the provinces. So Shakespeare and Tagore, two poets who have given their literatures direction, blood, and genius. The directions of their journeys might have been different, but the subsoil of their writing have come from the provinces. So those like me mocked for their rustic accent. The fathers, my father, Annie and Noah's father, uh, those writing letters urgently to the far away, returning literature to its etymological instinct literata. Um, so, you know, race, class, caste, gender, the human, and this awful category called the non-human, um, it's a terrible, terribly condescending name, isn't it, non-human, to define someone by a lack. So all these categories, intellectual, as much as they are emotional, these categories have directed our political consciousness and the investigative energy of the humanities for decades now. But why not the provincial? Why hasn't provincial experience been studied as an intellectual category in any culture? I wanted to come to the category of the uh, provincial, not with a fa fault finding apparatus, not as a victim, but with joy and gratitude for the unique character of life that has been given to provincials. Uh, about my visit to Yale in the second week of September, yes, I'm grateful to Diane Barrett Brown for inviting me to be at the Whitney Humanities Center. And of course, Jennifer Banks, my wonderful, wonderful editor at Yale University Press for facilitating this. And I'd love to use this opportunity to meet you and Ryan and a few other professors and students whose work I admire immensely. Well, it's going to be a great occasion. We'll lay down the garland path <laughs> that you can walk <laughs> over. Um, and I want to um, just say that there's a few questions um, that we I can, I've been answering a few, but let me read a few out loud. and. And I also put in the chat the forum on religion and ecology here at Yale, which has resources from all the world's religions to, to support this kind of growth of consciousness of the deep um, spiritual ecology of all of the world's religions and so on. And Journey of the Universe, the film that, that uh, Amy mentioned. But let me come, one of the questions is, and maybe we can do these short because there's a few I'd like to get to. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, can you comment on your favorite poets? Would you like to name a few, maybe other than Tagore, who we all love? <laughs> uh, Tagore is my favorite uh, singer-writer. Um, I, I don't, songwriter, sorry. I, 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 it's impossible to translate him because of what he does uh, to Bangla as a language. Um, he's bringing, he's making the language modern 
um, by making us live through and walk through the language by giving it rhythm, internal rhyme, so much that is difficult to kind of explain in a session uh, such as this one. My, um, I think I was formed more by poetry in Bangla, in Bengali, than I was in English. But in, during my school life, I was forced to read Robert Frost, um, whom I continue to love. At that point of time, till up to the age of 19, I think, I wanted to uh, write like Robert Frost and uh, the writer George Eliot, because I thought they had a brilliant and beautiful uh, analogical and metaphorical imagination. As I, when I would go on to study literature, I would discover um, that Robert Frost had a natural association with the land. This New England poet who knew a lot more about chickens and farmlands that mo that mo than most English language poets do or did. Uh, and then of course, John Clare, uh, another poet, uh, this, um, you know, from England, uh, who's, who, whose life, and um, in whose life as a working in the farm in the farms and living with apple trees and you know a, a very different kind of landscape how that would annotate the form of his poetry and how the division of the commons you know into rectangular fields how that would kind of drive him mad as it were insane um my poet the first poet I would say I fell in love with was John Donne, uh, who was characterized as a metaphysical poet on the English literature syllabus. He would eventually um, go on to give some wonderful sermons, and some of which are very, very famous, as many of you would recognize from uh, your familiarity with these Christian sermons. My favorite poets in Bangla, um, Shokti Chattopadhyay. I'll be happy to write these names, or if you write to me, I'll be happy to respond to all of you. Uh, S H A K T I, Shokti Chattopadhyay, Jibon Ananda Das, whose name has the word Ananda, meaning joy, delight, happiness, pleasure, a kind of tradition of joy, as it were, in the name. Tagore, without a doubt, Tagore. Um, I think these were the poets that kind of formed me. Um, hi, Meg, uh, I'm able to read this question. Uh, just write to me if you Google, uh, you might come across my website or my page on the Ashoka University website, but it's easy to remember, Shumona, S-U-M-A-N-A, 001, not 007, 001 at gmail.com. Uh, so you can write to me and if, always happy. I, I teach poetry to my students. Always, always happy to discuss poetry. That's wonderful. And we will put Sumana's website and uh, the Institute here of Sacred Music, their work and the Forum on Religion and Ecology. We'll put all of that into uh, a follow-up email for sure. And I just Amy's put it there. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, that's great. Um, and a couple of people are asking about spiritual ecology, which um, is the notion, as Thomas Berry said, if there's no spirituality in the earth, there's no spirituality in us. And that's what Sumana's work helps us to see. You know, it's not just we're some special creatures that we're given in like the Michelangelo picture in the Vatican, or that we're given life uh, by God and everything else is dead. You see, this is part of the problem of our immense arrogance of anthropocentrism. So yeah. what's coming across and why Simona's work is so important is this notion that we're in a living earth community, a sacred universe, as one of Thomas Berry's books was called. So there's also a website on spiritual ecology, and we'll be putting more on our forum website. Um, but other questions um, that I just wanted to um maybe highlight, of course, some people are asking about children and the need for children's books. And I know you have um, the beauty of your two uh, nephews, nieces. <laughs> um, but do you want to say anything about 
um, children and, and this kind of sensibility so natural to them? Uh, I, I want to, uh, in this response, if you allow me, uh, about spiritual ecology, um, I understand that this is a discipline that is very important. Uh, but I also, I think all of us recognize from just being alive that we are all attuned to some form of spiritual ecology. Um, I just mentioned while speaking about in response to um, Mary Evelyn's question about how I became a tree. I mentioned the scientist Jagadish Chandra Bose um, who discovered that plants were living beings who had to fight to kind of prove to the world that plants were living and he also said sentient beings. So the question that he wanted to answer was, is there any possible, and this is the question, and th these, these are his words in Bangla that I'm translating for you in English. Is there any possible relation between our own life and the plant world? So this was the question that is a, you know, that propelled his research, which is only a manifestation of his belief in the life of all things. As Mary Evelyn was saying, that we are not a special species. So, um, you know, in his book, for instance, Plant Autographs and Their Revelations, he, he wants plants to write. He's looking for a Toru Lipi, a plant script, so that we have plants writing to us in a language that we would possibly interpret, if not understand. And for him, the most, so he was trying to understand, he was a philosopher, I would say, he was a philosopher of life. And for him, as I understand it, for him, what is the category of the living? What constitutes the category of the living? It is response. Anything that can respond is alive. It is what makes us living. It is the mark of the living. So, uh, and he's writing all of this, his argument for plants, is moving, affectionate, completely idiosyncratic, even eccentric and slightly mad, but never unscientific. And so he wants, he, he wants to give us the plant's autobiography. And you know, one of the things that he wants to write about is the fact that he often writes about not having children. And then, as I said, treating plants or writing about plants in this register of infancy and uh, childlikeness and so on. Um, it is possible to misread him, but it is also possible to embrace that notion of a relationship outside blood, outside our species, to think of everything around us as family. So uh, his plant philosophy, I think, is one of the most non-anthropocentric, practical philosophy that a human has possibly imagined. In one of his essays, he writes about a child, his nephew, in all likelihood, having a very high fever. And, you know, you mentioned my nephew and niece, Mary Evelyn, and I want to say that I have learned to see the world and experience the world in language and in that kind of um, register, you know, to live that, to live life in a new way in the last 11 or 12 years since my nephew was born. To, to ask these questions, not this kind of compulsive morality to be a better citizen of the earth, to keep the earth alive for them, but to but to rehabilitate it, rehabilitate the sense of wonder that with which they see the world. If anything causes me joy and wonder, I will want to protect it. And so I think this is what we can take from children. I love it. And um, several people are asking, you know, about who's writing on, on these kinds of issues. Um, and there's there's an online book called Living Earth Community that many uh, people are speaking about the, I like to call it differentiated sentience. So plants 
this incredible scientist Bose, who we all need to understand better, just had this love of plants, but his not only intuitive, but his scientific work saying these are, are sentient. So the, the yeah. differentiated sentience between plants and trees and roots like Suzanne Samard and like yes. uh, Sheldrake, Merlin Sheldrake and fungi. And in, on this Living Earth Community website, yes. there's articles of Eduardo Cohn talking about thinking like a forest and David Abram, the sensuous, uh, spell of the sensuous and so on. And Paul Wadeau and the animal behavior work that's like, of course there's consciousness, of course there's communication. This is one of the most exciting movements uh, of our time. And Sumana is for sure one of the great writers, thinkers, beings. Um, it's hard even to describe it in this in this particular space. So I'm afraid we we may have to wind up in a few more moments. And of course, someone's mentioned Robin Kimmer in the, yes, uh, in the chat. And you know what's coming together at the School of Science here, of the environment, and so on. But the understanding is that we need to be bifocal. We need the sciences, the ecology and biology, but we need indigenous ways of knowing and knowledge from all the cultures of the world that have this spiritual ecology. That's what Sumana is bringing to us. So this fusion um, is a whole new way of being, of thinking uh, in, in the world itself. So um, maybe just a, a final uh, thought Sumana, there's so many uh, things. I just I haven't been able to read all the comments, uh, and I'll request Amy to send them to me. Uh, yeah. I think Judith says Orion should be the text in all university ecology courses, and I'm not saying this because I happen to be on an, um, you know on a panel which involves Orion. You'll remember that I shared this with you, Mary Evelyn, when we spoke uh, in March that last semester I was teaching a course on the, because you mentioned a grad student writing about birds. I said, I taught a course, which I called the bird as the essay, the bird and the essay. And where I was looking at the anatomy of the bird, the habit, habitats, and, you know, birding, the damage it had done and how we could look at different forms of the essay you know, as almost in an analogical imagination, uh, in the manner of, you know, uh, uh, the uh, metaphorical and or an analogical imagination. And believe me, if I share my course list with you, most of these essays were from Orion. Uh, Orion primarily, but also a few essays from Emergence magazine. Uh, I want to say that Orion, as far as my uh, kind of reading on avian life goes, has the best archive on bird life. On, on it, It's an extraordinary archive. And I hope many of you who are interested in birds and plants and so on will read these essays, absolutely extraordinary essays on the website. Absolutely. And I believe they collected some of those essays in a book on birds too. Amy can maybe put that in the chat. Um, Several people like Bud are talking about new story, universe story, this larger sense that's emerging. All of these ideas are exploding, um, you know, Thomas Berry's new story and so on. But someone was asking about Adrian about animism, and it might be an interesting note to conclude on and offer, uh, of course, Sumana heard the last words, because and someone's mentioning Joy Harjo, our wonderful poet laureate, and so on. I want to tell you, John and I are going to a class at the Divinity School with Willie Jennings, who's an African-American systematic theologian. The class is on animism and natural theology. And he begins almost every class with a poem by Joy Harjo. It is electrifying. Wow. This is a transformative moment when in Yale Divinity School, we have a class on animism. Um, so... <laughs> I just wanted to give you know some of the good news amidst everything we're living in. But any final words here, Sumana, because this has been such a joy to be with you. And I know people have loved your reflections. Final words. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, about animism, uh, again, to turn to Bose, for instance, who was um, 
who was moved or educated by what was in the air at the time. He was Brahmo, that is, he had moved from mainstream Hinduism, but was educated by uh, also by Buddhist texts and the energy of these texts to recognize that there was life everywhere. Uh, so there are folk tales about him discovering the Maimosa Pudika, the Touch Me Not, uh, and all of that. Uh, I just want to say that uh, it is possible. Let, let me share this this one last thought. I, among the many courses I teach at this university, from where I'm speaking to you, this is actually my office, where it's you know half past ten in, at in the evening. Um, my favorite course to teach has been the Rasa course, you know, which is a theory of art emotion that dates back to 4th or 5th century CE in the Indian subcontinent. And though it was, we're talking about animism, I just want to relate this to something, to a, to a history of emotion. So that though it was initially based on performance art. My, the aim of, my aim in teaching my, uh, this course was to make my students experience and understand and articulate, consequently articulate, the relationship between the elements and emotions, human emotions, of course. And I thought to myself that, and this is the favorite course among everything I teach, that if I'm able to remind them of this elemental nature of our lives through their writing, through their practice, I am certain that something will make them preserve and protect the natural world. And um, yeah, so I'd like to end on that note that the range of our emotions should not be limited. We should not think of this in terms of what we, what I feel for Mary Evelyn or what Mary Evelyn feels for John and so on. But to enlarge the perimeter to, you know, the heart is the most populated continent in the world. You can put everyone there and still you'll be able to put more. Uh, so uh, it is possible that we might be able to feel more emotions rather than just this bureaucratic need to save some species because it will be for our good. When we talk of the end of the world, we only mean the end of humans, not the end of the entire planet. So let us just increase the perimeter of our emotions for everything around us. Just that. I love it. Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. And Abraham yes. Heschel called all of us to awe and wonder, as did Rachel Carson in her beautiful book, Sense of Wonder. So what a beautiful note to end on. We thank you immensely for who you are, your compassion, your elegance, your literary uh, gifts. Such a pleasure, such a joy. And we thank the Institute for Sacred Music and Orion for partnering with this wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank and you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.